Hello, my name is Dr. Patricia Murray. I am a doctor of osteopathic medicine and I specialize in neuromusculoskeletal medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. I would like to take this time to welcome you to this course on the pelvis. It is the next course in my series entitled Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Demonstration Series. In this course on the pelvis, we will have two parts to it. The first part of the course, I will give a functional anatomy lecture on the anominates and the pubic symphysis. After that lecture, we will do a lab where I will demonstrate multiple different types of techniques on how to treat the somatic dysfunctions for the anominates and the pubic symphysis. The second half of the course will cover the sacrum. I will give a functional anatomy lecture and then a lab on the different somatic dysfunctions of the sacrum and how to treat them. I hope you enjoy the course. The pelvis. The pelvis uh, structure has four primary bones, the two anominates on either side as an adult, uh, the sacrum, and the coccyx. Remember that when we're born, the two anominates are actually each divided into three different bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubes. The sacrum also, when we're born, is five different segments. But as we age, and by about the age of 20, the anominates and the tailbone all fuse into their primary bones. The primary joints of the sacrum that we'll be discussing in this course are the sacroiliac joints, two on either side, and the pubic symphysis anteriorly. The other thing I'd like to draw your attention to structurally with the, over, the whole pelvis is that the pelvis is divided into a true pelvis and a false pelvis. The true pelvis is, starts at the sacral promontory the arcuate line and the pectinate lines that, as you see in this image, shows, uh, creates the top of the true pelvis bowl. And then the inferior uh, structure in the true pelvis is the pelvic diaphragm. Above those lines would be considered the false pelvis. In this first lecture on the pelvis, what I'd like to focus on primarily are the anominates and the pubic symphysis. So we will cover this functional anatomy lecture on these areas of the pelvis and then we will cover the lab. This slide, before we get into the anominates uh, and the pubes specifically, I would like to emphasize the idea that the pelvis is such an important structure within our bodies and a significant place for somatic dysfunctions and imbalances to take place because it is in the middle of our body. As we stand, there is weight and force that is going to come down through our spine and through our bodies into the sacrum and out into the anominates and then down through our legs to the ground. But then also from the ground up through our legs and up into the pelvis through the anominates and into the sacrum and into our upper bodies. So you realize that there is forces from both directions and they all meet in the pelvis. And so the pelvis is a very important structure to know well as a manual medicine practitioner. Let's also review the muscles acting at the hip and affecting the pelvis from particularly from below. Now we did review these in our lower extremity course, but it's so important to connect the different regions of the body and the pelvis and the anominates are, and the pubic bone are going to be very affected by these muscles, so it's important for us to review them again. What I recommend you do is pull out your favorite anatomy book that you typically review things from and look up these different muscles we're going to review as I review them in these slides. So first, the, the different uh, categories of muscles we're going to be reviewing are the flexors, which pull the pelvis anteriorly, the extensors that pull the pelvis posteriorly, the AB ductors, which act to stabilize the pelvis uh, when we are standing on a, a steady leg, but also will pull uh, the hip and the pelvis laterally. 
The next would be the AD ductors, which also when we're standing on a stable leg act to stabilize the pelvis. But when that leg is swinging or moving, uh, these muscles, the AD ductors, pull the leg and the pelvis medially. And finally, the fifth category we will cover are the external rotators of the hip and pelvis. So the first category, hip flexors. The major hip flexors are iliacus and psoas, with a minor aspect or a lesser degree of hip flexion or pelvic flexion happening when the rectus femoris contracts or sartorius contracts. So just quickly reviewing their attachments and obviously going through your anatomy book as you review these, is the iliacus travels from the ala or attaches to the ala of the ilia in the iliac fossa, and it travels to and attaches or inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. The psoas muscle attaches on all five lumbar vertebrae in the lumbar spine and then travels through the pelvis to the lesser trochanter of the femur. And again, the lesser or minor hip flexors, rectus femoris, attaching to the anterior inferior iliac spine and then traveling to the patella, down around the patella and attaching at the tibial tuberosity. And sartorius muscle, traveling from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial tibia. The next category are the extensor group, and this consists of the three hamstring muscles primarily, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris. Remember that your semimembranosus and semitendinosus are your medial hamstring muscles, and your bicep femoris is your lateral hamstring muscles. These are major extensors of the pelvis and hip. The medial hamstrings attach from the ischial tuberosity down to the medial proximal tibia, and the bicep femoris attaches to the sacrotuberous ligament, the ischial tuberosity, and then travels on the lateral side of the femur and attaches to the fibular head and the lateral condyle of the tibia. This is a good example of a muscle that is not just attaching to bone, that sometimes muscles will attach to ligaments, and therefore there is this uh, fascial and muscular connective tissue train or path, if you will, that will go from the pelvis down through the leg, past the knee, and down into the uh, tibia and below. So remember that we are connected from head to toe, and many of these anatomical connective tissue pathways have been dissected out all the way from the cranium to the feet, and this is an example of one of those areas. The gluteus maximus is another extensor uh, of the pelvis and hip. It is a very large muscle, and it attaches to the ilium and the sacrum, but also attaches to the sacrotuberous ligament, and the, then travels over to the greater trochanter and the shaft of the femur, and all the way interdigitates into the iliotibial tract. So again, another example of a muscle that not just attaching from a part of a bone to another part of a bone to move joints, but also is interdigitates with ligaments and other fascial tissues. The next category, the AB ductors, this group includes gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and to a more minor effect, the tensor fasciolata. The gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus both attach to the ilium, and basically the gluteus medius just sits more superficially on top of gluteus minimus, which is deep to it, and they both go over and attach to the greater trochanter of the femur, and when they contract, they primarily abduct the hip and pelvis. The next category, the AD ductors, and this group includes the adductors. The adductor magnus, the adductor brevis, and the adductor longus are the primary AD ductors of the pelvis and hip, but also gracilis and pectineus. All of these muscles attach along the pubic bone and the pubic ramus, 
and then go down and attach to the medial aspect of the femur. The only one of these that crosses the knee joint is the gracilis, remember, and it is, part, it is one of the three muscles that attach at the pes and serine area on the medial tibia. And again, all of these muscles function to adduct the hip. And the final group I'd like to review with you related to motions of the hip and pelvis are the lateral or external rotators. And these include the piriformis muscle, obturator internus, obturator externus, gemellus superior, gemellus inferior, and the quadratus femoris. These muscles, when you take them all together and you look at their position uh, within the pelvis, it's obvious that they externally rotate the hip. But they also could be compared, if you will, to the rotator cuff of the shoulder, and you could consider these muscles, if you will, the rotator cuff of the hip. So looking at them in context, in this image, you see a few muscles we've already talked about. The gluteus medius is resected here and seeing its attachments along the ilium, the sacrum, and then the sacrotuberous ligament. You also see cut back the gluteus medius and it, seeing where it would overlie the gluteus minimus that's deep to it. The next muscle to draw your attention to is the darker, more dark red muscle, which is the piriformis. And remember, the piriformis attaches to the anterior surface of the sacrum and then over to the greater trochanter. Uh, you'll see the sciatic nerve running in this image inferior to the piriformis muscle. And in majority of us, that is true. But remember, in a small uh, percentage of the population, that sciatic nerve may pierce the piriformis muscle. And people with that instance may be at more risk for piriformis syndrome where the sciatic nerve gets impinged or pinched when the muscle contracts and they get a burning radiating pain down the back of the thigh. Inferior to the piriformis muscle is where you see the rest of the external rotating group. And the next one just inferior to the piriformis is the superior gemellus and then the obturator internus where you see it dives deep to the sacrotuberous ligament and covers the obturator a uh, foramen. Inferior to that is the inferior gemellus. And then the final muscle in the group that's visible here is the quadratus femoris. The obturator externus is not viewed well in this image. But you'll see that this complex uh, group of muscles all act together to very strongly externally or laterally rotate the hip and can have a strong effect on the anominate as well as the sacrum and pelvic issues. To review just a little bit more about the piriformis because it's such a unique muscle, again, as I said just a moment ago, a small percentage of the population, 10 to 12% of the population, that sciatic nerve can pierce the piriformis and cause sciatic problems and sciatic syndrome. The other thing that's important and unique about the piriformis is that with the leg, the femur and the leg fully extended, the piriformis is absolutely an external rotator of the hip and pelvis. But if you bring the hip into full flexion, actually the line and the, and the contraction of the piriformis will actually cause internal rotation of the hip. So keep that in mind as you're working with these areas. And finally, it is the only rotator in the external rotators that connects directly to the sacrum. And remember, it attaches to the, primarily the anterior surface of the sacrum. So now, why have we reviewed these muscles in relation to the pelvis? Well, remember that if someone has tight hamstrings, it's going to be pulling down on the ischial tuberosities and having an effect on the anominates. If a person has tight hip flexors or the iliopsoas muscles, it's going to be pulling on the pelvis and the innominate as well and increasing lumbar lordosis. So people in this position will definitely increase their lumbar lordosis and have an anterior pelvic tilt, which will then also cause the abdomen to be protuberant and will increase compensatorially all of the curves of the spine. So if you have an increased lumbar lordosis, 
You're also going to have an increased thoracic kyphosis and finally, of course, at the top, an excessive cervical lordosis. Now, why is this important? Well, obviously, it's going to be causing imbalances and dysfunction. And as you see this red line now, this is the gravitational line that if someone has normal posture, you would see this line running through the lateral portion of the, uh, right in front of the, the patella and up through the femur and through the pelvis more, much more in line with the, the medial aspect of the pelvis than you see in the skeleton here that is having dysfunction. So now let's focus primarily on the anominates and get into the anominates and the pubic symphysis. So again, remember that the anominates, which there are two of them on either side forming the walls of the pelvis and particularly in the adult. But remember that when we're born, the anominates are three separate bones, the ilium, the ischium, which has our sits bones posteriorly, and then the pubic bones anteriorly. But by the time we're approximately 20 years old, these fuse and you have an anominate on either side that is fused as one bone. The pubic symphysis anteriorly here where the pubes come together. Remember that this is a definitive joint. This is a fibrocartilaginous joint and it actually has an interpubic disc. So it is absolutely an area that is made to, to move and have motion and you can develop dysfunctions there. So what somatic dysfunctions are we going to be focusing on when we talk about the anominates and the pubes? Well, first we're going to talk about in, the anominates can rotate. They can rotate forward or anteriorly, or an anominate can rotate backward or posteriorly. An anominate can shear, which means one anominate can move superiorly or cephalad in relation to the sacrum or an anominant can move caudad or inferiorly in relation to the sacrum. And so when you compare one anominant on, on the left, let's say, to the anominant on the right, your findings in their different landmarks you're going to be looking at are going to not be symmetric. The next somatic dysfunction we will be evaluating, and evaluating for and diagnosing is anominants can flare. An anominate can flare out and an anominate can flare in. And this is measured by the position of the anterior superior iliac spine relative to the midline, such as the umbilicus. And the, so with the anominates, they can rotate, they can shear, or they can flare. And then the pubic bones in relation to each other can also shear. So the pubic symphysis can have a dysfunction where one pube is superior in relation to the other or one pube is inferior in relation to the other. So now in order to diagnose these different somatic dysfunctions, there are certain palpatory landmarks that we're going to need in order to compare one side to the other. And the anterior palpatory landmarks for the pelvis that are going to be very important to us are the anterior superior iliac spine or the ASIS, then the pubic symphysis, the iliac crests, and the greater trochanters. Of this list, the ones we will be using constantly and the most are the ASIS and the pubic symphysis. And here is an image that shows you these different landmarks as pointing to the skeleton. So the red arrow is pointing to the anterior superior iliac spine. The purple arrow is pointing to the iliac crest heights. The green arrow is pointing to the anterior portion of the pubes where the pubic symphysis is. And the yellow arrow is pointing to the greater trochanters of the hips and the femur. The palpatory landmarks that we'll be utilizing in the pelvis are the posterior superior iliac spines, the sacral sulci, and the ischial tuberosities. And of course, we'll be going over these in lab on exactly how to find them, but on a skeleton to see where these are, the posterior superior iliac spines, you'll notice the red arrow in this skeleton is pointing to that. And you will see that it's a big knuckly bony area on the posterior aspect of the anominate. Now, 
if you were to put your thumbs on the, on the posterior superior iliac spines and drop medially off the PSIS, you will drop into where the yellow arrow is showing you the sacral sulci. Now the sacral sulci is a divot area where your thumb should be able to drop in there and you'll see that there's a space from the PSIS to the deeper structure, the base of the sacrum. And we're going to be using that space a lot to determine what's happening with the sacrum itself. So the sacral sulci is a very important posterior landmark we'll be using, as well as the PSIS. The ischial tuberosities that the other yellow is, arrow is pointing to, you'll notice is our, our sits bones at the inferior most point on the anominates. And at times, you will palpate, the, palpate these areas to make some uh, comparisons. But the primary two posterior landmarks are the sacral sulci and the posterior superior iliac spines, the PSISs. So now let's talk about some somatic dysfunctions that you would be diagnosing or evaluating for. The first we want to discuss is an anominant rotation. An anominate can rotate on the sacrum. So we're talking about the anominate bone on the right or the left, and it articulates with the sacrum poster posteriorly. And that anominant will rotate on that SI joint. And so you can have an anterior anominate rotation. And your findings, if you have this, would be that the ASIS anteriorly would be found to be inferior in relation to the opposite side, and the PSIS posteriorly would be superior to the PSIS on the other side. So the dysfunctional side the, would be the side that you find these findings. So the ASIS would be inferior and the PSIS would be superior. So it would look like this. This is a left anominate that you are looking at. And you'll notice this is a demonstration of an anterior anominate rotation. So if this anominant rotates to the left, and the anterior portion of the anominant would therefore move inferiorly, and the ASIS would be found to be inferior versus the other side ASIS, and the PSIS posteriorly would move superiorly. So here's another image now where you're looking at the pelvis from an anterior posterior view, and this is the same type of dysfunction, a right innominate anterior rotation. So this innominate on the right here is going to rotate out of the screen in towards you, and if that happens, you'll notice that that right ASIS will move inferior, and the right PSIS will move superior. And again, these findings would be in comparison to the opposite side that is not dysfunctional. The other type of rotation you can have as a somatic dysfunction is a posterior innominate rotation. In this case, we're going to have the opposite findings. So the ASIS is going to be found superior, and the PSIS is going to be found inferior. So let's see what that would look like. And again, now you're looking at the pelvis anterior view again, and this is a right innominate posterior rotation being demonstrated. So you'll notice that if that right innominate was to rotate away from you deeper into the screen, you would have a posterior innominate rotation. And in that, you would find that the right anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, would be superior to the other side, and the PSIS would be inferior on the dysfunctional side to the non-dysfunctional side. A completely different type of uh, innominant somatic dysfunction would be an innominant shear. And this happens when both the ASIS and the PSIS, meaning the anterior portion of the pelvis and the posterior portion of the innominant, are both found to be superior in relation to the non-dysfunctional side. So the entire innominant can shear or upslip or shear upward and the entire innominate can also be found to shear downward. So you can have, the, they're either called a shear or a, a upslip or a downslip. 
and this is what that might look like. So again, looking at laterally at one of the innominants, and you'll notice that it, with a superior innominant shear, both the ASIS and the PSIS on this side in comparison to the non-dysfunctional side, the opposite innominant, will be found to be, to be superior. This also is demonstrating a left superior innominant shear. So you'll notice that the ASIS anteriorly and the PSIS uh, posteriorly are both superior when you compare them to the other side in this dysfunction. The next somatic dysfunction you can find in the innominants are flares. A flare occurs when the ASIS is found to be more medial or towards the midline on one side, on the dysfunctional side versus the non-dysfunctional side, or it is, the dysfunctional side is found to be more lateral than the non-dysfunctional side. It is typically measured from the, something in the midline, so you would be either looking at the xiphoid process, for example, or the umbilicus, and comparing each ASIS to the midline. If the closer ASIS is the dysfunctional side, that would mean you have an inflare. If the dysfunctional side is the more lateral ASIS, that would mean you have an out flare. So this image is showing you these two different ideas. This is an innominant flare. So you will see that the red arrows are going from the xiphoid process out to the two ASISs and the purple arrows are starting at the umbilicus and going out to the two ASISs. So that's where you can even ask a patient to put their finger in their belly button to give you a landmark to be looking at and then you would palpate for the ASISs on either side. And if the dysfunctional side is the one that is more medial, such as the green arrow here, then you have an inflare. If the dysfunctional side is the ASIS that is more lateral, such as the purple, the lighter purple colored arrow here, you have an out flare. Now I've been using this terminology of the dysfunctional side versus the non-dysfunctional side quite a bit. And the key is to be able to understand how do you determine which side is the dysfunctional side. And there are two tests you can use to determine this. First of all, you can do what's called a compression test. This typically has a patient laying flat on their back in a supine position. You would lay the thenar eminence of your hands on the front of their pelvis on the ASISs, and you would then compress compressed down on either side of the pelvis and on the innominants one at a time on either side and ask yourself which side is more restricted. So you're pressing down with a force down into the SI joints. And the SI joint that won't move or has less bounce or less mobility is the restricted side and that tells you that the dysfunctional side is the side that won't bounce, won't move, won't compress well. The other side is the non-dysfunctional side. The second test you can use to determine which side is the dysfunctional side is called the standing flexion test. With this test, you would typically have your patient standing and you would be behind the patient with your hands first on the iliac crest and then your thumbs are going to want to be right underneath the posterior superior iliac spines. And then you're going to have your patient bend forward. So when the patient bends forward, the innominants, if, if the innominant is restricted at the SI joint on the sacrum, that innominant is going to start to rise along with the sacrum as the lumbar spine flexes the tailbone will rise up with it, and if the innominant is restricted on the sacrum, it will rise as well. So you'll notice that the restricted side, the dysfunctional side, your thumb will rise, and that's telling you that that's your dysfunctional side. The other side won't move as much, and that's the non-dysfunctional side. So you notice both of these tests, the compression test and the standing flexion test, are two tests to use to, to lateralize which side is your dysfunctional side of the pelvis 
and which is your non-dysfunctional side. The next somatic dysfunction I'd like to discuss are called the pubic shears. A pubic shear is found when the pubic ramus on the dysfunctional side is either superior or inferior to the pubic ramus on the non-dysfunctional side. This can be found in conjunction with an innominate dysfunction, meaning if an innominate is, has an innominate rotation or an innominate shear, then the pube may also be found to have the same dysfunction on that side. But that does not have to be the case. A pubic dysfunction can be found in isolation and not necessarily an innominate dysfunction, but many times they do coexist with one another. So here is a diagram or an image with the pelvis and these arrows are showing you a pubic shear. And so if the right pubic shear is superior, you'll notice in this case the green arrow on the right is pointing upward. So the pubic ramus on the right would be found to be superior versus the pubic ramus on the left and when you do the, comp the compression test or the standing flexion test, those would typically in this diagnosis be found to be positive on the right. Now, at this point we've reviewed the primary somatic dysfunctions of the innominates and the pubes. And the most common somatic dysfunctions in the innominates and the pubes that you will find are the anterior and posterior rotation of the innominates and the superior or inferior pubic shears. And the reason for this is that these motions are physiologic motions. They are normal motions during gait. So what I want to do with you here a moment is review the phases of gait. So there are different parts or steps when we are walking there are certain phases in the gait phase and the first phase is called the swing phase so when you are swinging your leg in order to prepare for the second phase which is called heel strike you then strike your heel to the ground and then your foot becomes flat goes into flat foot and then finally in order to propel ourselves forward we toe off so these four phases swing phase to heel strike to flat foot to toe off are alternating constantly from one leg to the other as we walk. When this occurs and we swing our leg to prepare for heel strike, our innominate in the swinging leg normally goes into a posterior rotation. So the innominate physiologically does a posterior nominant rotation and a little bit of an out flare in order to prepare for heel strike. Once that heel has struck and we go into flat foot and now we are preparing for toe off, that same innominant goes into an anterior nominant rotation and a little bit of an in flare in order to push off and propel us forward. So you'll notice that innominate rotations and pubic shears that many times go together are normal motions during gait. What happens though is that dysfunctions develop when restrictions occur at the SI joint or at the pubic symphysis and cause the innominate to be stuck in an anterior rotation or stuck in a posterior rotation or etc. Now also in lab on the innominates and the pubes that we're going to go into in a minute, I will be demonstrating the still technique. And what I need to do is take a moment here and explain something related to the sacroiliac joint. And the fact is that Dr. Van Buskirk, when he treats the innominate on the, Ill, I'm sorry, the innominate on the sacrum, the SI joint, he is taking into consideration the superior pole of that joint, the middle pole of that joint, and the inferior pole of that joint. So I need to introduce this concept in relation to the sacrum before the lab. So let's take a moment and look at this sacrum here and look at the articulatory surface that you see here that is L-shaped. It looks like, if you will, an upside-down L. 
and the two branches of the L, the base of the L, and then the, uh, you know, the stand of the L, if you will, is a superior pole of this joint and an inferior pole of this joint. And then you'll notice where the two branches of the L would come together would be considered the middle pole of this joint. And when we talk about the sacrum and how it moves, there are, there is, the sacrum flexes or extends on a transverse axis. And you'll notice here that there are actually three transverse axes, one at the superior pole, one at the middle pole, and one at the inferior pole. Now all of these transverse axes are approximately at the level of S2, the second sacral segment. But when we talk about these transverse axes and their relation to the sacrum with flexion and extension, the superior pole is considered the respiratory transverse axis. It attaches, it primarily is the place in which the dura coming down from the cranium and down from surrounding the spinal cord attaches at S2, again, the second sacral segment of the sacrum. And that is considered the superior transverse axis of the sacrum. And it is the place in which the sacrum flexes or extends in a respiratory or cranial sacral perspective. The middle transverse axis is also approximately at S2, and it is considered the postural axis for flexion and extension. So when we are standing and we flex forward, or we stand up and extend the lumbar spine, and the sacrum actually flexes, the sacrum is moving on this middle transverse axis, the postural axis. And finally, the inferior transverse axis also at S2 is considered the hip bone axis. And it is this transverse axis upon which the innominate rotates on the sacrum. So let's look at an image that shows you this concept. Here you just see that the top transverse axis, the purple transverse axis, which is the middle transverse axis, and the yellow transverse axis all approximately occur at the level of S2 and they each have a different physiologic purpose when the sacrum flexes or extends or when the innominate rotates on the sacrum. And again, when we go in lab now, I'm going to be demonstrating uh, during a portion of the lab the still technique. And that technique, as you know, was developed with, by Dr. Van Buskirk. And Dr. Van Buskirk will be talking about these three poles in relation to the sacroiliac joint when he treats, uh, for example, a sacral, I'm sorry, an innominate shear. So in summary, during this first lecture on the functional anatomy of the pelvis, which focused, uh, we have reviewed the pelvic bones and joints. And again, we have focused primarily in this lecture on the innominates and the pubic symphysis. We have reviewed the muscles that have a significant effect on the function and the dysfunction of the pelvis pre predominantly from below. We have reviewed the landmarks for diagnosing somatic dysfunction. We have reviewed the types of somatic dysfunction found in the anominates and in the pubic symphysis. And finally, we have introduced the concept of the SI joint having a superior, a middle, and an inferior pole. To learn more about how to continue taking these courses, please go to my website, 